गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू आयुका द इंटर यूनिवर्सिटी सेंटर फॉर एस्ट्रोनॉमी एंड एस्ट्रोफिजिक्स टू वेरी पॉपुलर सब्जेक्ट्स और राधर जस्ट वन सब्जेक्ट एंड सम सब फील्ड देर हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू आर कमिंग हियर फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम ओ दैट्स अ लॉट वेरी गुड सो वेलकम मच मोर वेलकम I am Samir Dhurde, and uh, very happy to introduce you to the program which you are attending today here at Ayuka. And uh, just to begin with, I would like to thank the teachers, those who have registered with us, and uh, you know helped us carry on the things very uh, you know in a, in a very well-fashioned way. Uh, we are, we still are adjusting a few seats. but that's always a good thing because we are very happy to always see the house full yeah so please bear with us for a few minutes it's always good if you register for the talk and then uh, then we don't have to do this last minute adjustments and also if you arrive a little early but in the rains despite all the problems you have come so we are thankful for that on this early morning on the second saturday of the month this is a regular feature and i think all the teachers are very familiar with this uh, concept this series of talks that that we have at ayuka uh, it has been going on for more than 3 decades and uh, several you know students have also become teachers <laughs> that we know of several students have become researchers in various fields so we are very proud to say that this uh, kind of series has been going on for such a long time and in this we try to introduce you to working scientists people who are actually doing some research okay applying all the things that you learn in school but at a more advanced level right so they have of course always all of them also have been in schools like you yeah studied somewhere got some inspiration somewhere and gone into research and we have several of them at this particular research institute the institute for astrophysics here uh, we also have other than this uh, lecture we also have a lot of other programs which you can attend so if it's your first time here make sure you come again we i will announce a bit more about those programs after the talk is over and we'll share with you how you can uh, come and attend the other events that we have have here okay so <clears throat> this month is a special month since last year other than our of course our independence day we are also celebrating the national space day have you heard of this national space day because it's the first time we are celebrating it on 23rd of august we are celebrating the launch of because there have been so many launches which one no this is not the launch of this was the landing day of chandrayaan 3 yes so that, that's right i wanted you to find the flaw so uh, this is a special month for the people who are into space and we are also into space because of another mission which launched later and is now in space looking at the sun and finding out so many more details about things that we don't know of yet okay so <clears throat> today's talk is particularly relevant to that so we have today with us our, our researcher here at ayuka uh dr sneha pandit may i welcome you to the stage so uh, uh, dr sneha is a researcher particularly interested in studying the sun as an astrophysicist uh, she has had she's a she's a maharashtrian from here but she's had a nice career in which she did her uh, bachelor's and masters from uh, is bhopal and also her phd from oslo in norway okay so she's got a phd in solar physics the the study of the sun and to bring to us her field her work as well in a very simple and uh, nicely uh, made manner an attractive manner through this presentation which is titled life under the sun exploring habitability okay so let's welcome her and i pass on the stage to her welcome thank you so much hello all um so i'm sure everybody knows what the sun is uh but a few of you might know what habitability is uh, can you raise hands who knows what habitability is okay one two okay so 
the aim of this talk is that by the end of the talk we'll be able to answer these questions that what is habitability uh, what are the requirements for life and why does earth around the sun has life okay so uh, keep in mind i'm going to ask these questions at the end and you must be able to answer those okay so this is our uh, like map road map for the talk uh, we'll start with this question are we alone in this universe and then we will be able to answer one by one with uh, some tools some observations some theory and then we'll end up with the answers okay um so are we alone in the universe how do you know that <laughs> have you talked to aliens <laughs> so uh, there has been a lot of speculations about it whether or not are we alone in this universe and a lot of scientists uh, work on this question and these are the i'm sorry these are the uh, methods by which we can work on this question so Arthur C Clarke uh, he is a very uh, well known science popularizer uh, he said that there exist two possibilities one is that we are alone in the universe and the other one is that we are not alone in the universe right there can only be these two yes or no and both of these possibilities are equally terrifying because if we are alone in the universe then universe is so vast and we are the only planet with life on it that is very sad in a way and if we are not alone then there are other planets and other kind of life forms out there in the universe and those we don't know about how those forms are if they are friendly or not if they can come to attack us or not and that is also equally terrifying because we don't know the the other life forms so both of these possibilities are explored uh, scientists are very interested in that and now we'll dive into that okay so what is exoplanets who knows what is exoplanets can you tell exoplanet is a planet outside the solar system yes so exoplanets are any kind of planets which are outside the solar system but most of them orbit around the stars but some planets are called rogue planets those do not orbit around stars but they orbit around the centers of the galaxies and probably those are not the planets of our interest because we are looking at the planets which are around the stars because the uh, planet would need energy would need light to have life so we are only interested in the planets in in our habitability so looking for life with the planets which are around the stars um then we will now look at star planet interaction right so how do stars and planet interact with each other i would like to have answer from right can somebody tell do you how do you how do stars and planet interact with each other with uh, okay you are the same person uh, they interact gravitationally and yes light and heat of the star yes and one more thing magnetic fields yeah so gravity magnetic field and the heat heat radiation heat gravity and magnetic fields these are the ways that star interact with the planet uh, but how do we know how do we measure these things so we are going to look at one small mission uh, so these are people from ayuka you see the symbol of ayuka yeah. yeah so these are this is the team of suit so you must have seen aditya l1 launch last year yeah uh, so it it went to some place called l1 it is lagrange 1 orbit uh, which is a bit closer to the sun than the usual satellites are so usual satellites revolve around the earth but this uh, this aditya satellite it is a bit farther away so that it is closer to the sun comparatively so they produce something called suit uh, it is an instrument which is now uh, which was like uh, kept inside a rocket and that rocket was launched and now this suit instrument is observing sun in different wavelengths so the the wavelength of light is something that is produced outside the sun and uh, at different wavelengths look at different layers of the sun so you can you can see some features of the sun like this spots um or these uh, bright regions but not all wavelengths are showing the same features 
One thing to note is that we have different colors for different wavelengths for our uh, purposes to just distinguish in our heads that these are from different wavelengths. Uh, it's, it's not that the observation in, is in these colors. The observation of the sun or stars are usually just the intensity maps. That is, we can know like this is more intensity and less intensity. So it will usually be in black and white, but uh, colors look nice. So most of the scientists prefer having uh, different colors for different wavelengths so that they can associate it in their heads. Okay, so now further on we'll see uh, different observations from different observatories and those will be in different colors than these. But all the observations are just intensity numbers. Those do not have any colors and this is just a note that I want you to remember, okay? So now this is a movie. Is it playing? Yeah. So this observation is three different wavelengths. You can see those three wavelengths here. And this is from another observatory from NASA called SDO, Solar Dynamic Observatory. And on that SDO, there are several instruments. Like on Aditya L1, we have several instruments out of which one was suit. So on SDO, there are several instruments out of which one is this AIA, Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. And with that, we can see so many features of the sun. So there is this dark patch, which is kind of a hole. We call it coronal hole. And there are these bright features, which are like loops, or there are strings, or there are these uh, fibrils or these fiber-like structures coming out and so on. So these are the features uh, on our star. And we like to study these features so that we understand how our stars interact with us because we are the planet of our star. So, um, yeah. So what happens is this is another uh, observation from SDO AIA. And in, in this observation, we can see that there is some very bright, uh, a lot of material coming out of the sun. Now, this is an artistic representation. This is not how it looks, okay? This is just a art. But this is how it might be. Uh, so this, this whole material, it will come to the earth. It will come to all the planets in all the direction. But in that, it will also be coming to the earth. And the earth has a magnetic field. Now the magnetic field of the earth will get modified because these particles which are charged and magnetic which will come to the to near the earth's magnetic field. Now we have very strong earth's magnetic field which actually deviates these particles away from earth and they go further away and they do not come inside the atmosphere of earth. So having this strong magnetic field and having a thick atmosphere around the earth is actually saving us from uh, interacting with these very uh, notorious particles which are charged, which will have magnetic interaction. So if those particles come to us, they will harm us. But since we have this, this kind of magnetic interaction with our uh, host star, the sun, we are actually saved. So this is one of the major criteria for having life on the planet is having nice, strong magnetic field in the planet itself. So, for example, this kind of feature, which is called coronal mass ejection. So there is a big mass which is ejected out of a layer of the sun and then that can come to the earth. There is another uh, of this feature. So you can see here there are these small things happening and suddenly there is a mass ejection. So these kind of things continuously happen on the surfaces of the sun and those come to earth. And then because of the magnetic field, we are saved. What next? So we, we know that magnetic field is important. Then we have atmosphere around the earth. Earth is not like a, a rock and then there is nothing around it. There is a very large portion of air on top of it. And why is it important? We are just going to dive into biology for one slide and then we are not going to talk about it again, okay? So, uh, what is life made of? All the cells, uh, yeah? They are made up of molecules. Yes, so the molecules have a lot of things in it, right? Uh, most of the uh, living beings, they have almost 70% water. So, one criteria to look for life would be to find water on the surfaces of the planets. Because any form of life that we know of would have water in it. Then there are th other th chemicals, the th less 30% is other molecules. 
and those molecules are either proteins or RNA, DNA or lipids, fats and so on. So those molecules are majorly made of carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus. So looking at the composition of the uh, surface of the planet and the atmosphere around the planet is important to find life on it. So having carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus in either the surface or the atmosphere is very important. So currently, uh, this is also an artistic representation of the surface of Venus. Okay, so Venus is supposed to be a sulfur planet. What that means is the most of the planet is made of carbon dioxide, but it also has a lot of sulfuric uh, sulfur dioxide. What happens is if in, in previous observations, it is speculated that Venus might have had water, but since it is so close to the sun, all the water got evaporated and then there are comets going around. So the comets, when they pass through Venus's atmosphere, they just took all the evaporator. So all the gases that are around the planet, they are kind of taken out by the comet. So we cannot see much of uh, water content on Venus's observations. So what happens is if there was water and since there is sulfuric dioxide, they will interact and form. Do you know what they will form? Yes. Sulfuric acid. Yes. And next time I want somebody else to answer. Okay. We have one, one student who is answering, it's not good. Okay, so they will form sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is very harmful. It is a very strong acid and it will kind of harm any life that could have been there. So we do not want that for any other observations. If you are looking for life in other uh, systems, other stellar systems, uh, that means other planets around other stars, right? So uh, we are a solar system. So we are a planet around the sun but there are other stars and other planets revolve around them, that is stellar system. So in other stellar systems, when we are looking for life on the exoplanets, we don't want this kind of composition. So that's why it is very important to learn about the planets in our neighborhood, that is the planets in the solar system, so that we understand what cannot have life, right? Because we know that these planets do not have life. So now uh, this is one of the uh, ways that we do not want the planet to be. Another is the gas giants. We have Jupiter, Saturn, which are like huge planets, which are all made of gas. So one thing that we know is most of the life flourishes when there is a surface. So all the, uh, there are uh, organisms inside the oceans, they are in the water, but again that water can be held on the surface. So we need a surface, we need a rocky planet most of the times to have uh, life. So we cannot look at gas giants because firstly, they are very huge. Secondly, if there was life, it cannot evolve to uh, intelligent forms like monkeys or human beings or elephants and so on. Those are intelligent beings. It can be amoebas and small bacteria and so on, but it cannot evolve to bigger forms of life. So we are looking at uh, satellites of Jupiter. Jupiter has how many satellites? Does anybody know? Yes. Yes, a lot of satellites. So all, almost all of the satellites are rocky. So they, they have surface, some of them have atmospheres. So this particular picture is of a satellite called Europa. And this satellite has water on it. Uh, so we are looking for life on this kind of uh, satellite, rocky satellites of gaseous planets as well. So yeah, now we have established what kind of planet uh, chemistry it should have. The next part is the source of life, right? So even if the planet has surface, it would need energy for the life forms. So our sun is at such a nice distance from us. Most of the energy that it uh, sends us is absorbed by our surface. So um, that energy is either converted into greenhouse, that means we are warm enough to survive. It's not a cold ice age kind of a situation right now. And some of the energy is reflected uh, that will go away, that will uh, make the atmosphere warm. And the rest of the energy which is uh, in, in the layers of the atmosphere is absorbed by plants, which is converted to by chlorophyll, they convert it into energy and then most of the beings eat that and then they get energy and some beings eat other animals and then they get energy. 
So there is this energy budget that goes on and the only source for energy is the sun, is the host star. So we need the star to be nearby. One more thing is that the events that we saw before like the coronal mass ejections or prominences, those events can be very disruptive because they can send a big chunks of something called plasma which is most of the stars are made of. So plasma is basically charged gas. So we know three states of matter, right? Uh, can somebody tell? Yeah, somebody from that side. Can you tell? Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Solid, liquid and gas. Yes. And then when, when you probably go to bachelors, you would learn about the fourth state of matter. Plasma. Yes. So what plasma is, is, um, uh, is mostly gas, but the gas would have atoms and molecule intact. So atoms and molecule would not lose their electrons or you know be charged. But in plasma, uh, the, the atoms and molecules like lose electrons because of high energy. And because then they become charged, they uh, follow the magnetic field and motion of charges creates magnetic fields. So it is a magnetized charged gas, plasma. Most of the stars are made of that. And when a big chunk of mass from the sun comes to earth, it is sending that plasma to earth. And we are, we are scared of that because we don't know how to deal with such energetic, magnetic and charged uh, chunks of masses. So there have been a few events when uh, these kind of uh, events of uh, coronal mass ejections, let's say, they affected a lot of uh, human life. Like they, these charged particles come in the uh, electric grids and so on. So we'll, we are going to learn about that now. Firstly, we have at least these many satellites around the Earth. Does anybody know how many satellites there are? Approximately. Yeah. About one trillion. One trillion. Because uh, these are not satellites, they are space junk or space debris. Yes, but live satellites we have at, at a given point usually near 50,000 or so. And these satellites help us in GPS and uh, military operations and our day to day life like all the internet that we use is through relayed through satellites and so on. So we are very much dependent on satellites. And you must have uh, read in newspapers about an event in last December, in December 2023, when SpaceX... Uh, lost 59 exactly. So SpaceX sent a lot of satellites and there was this huge uh, coronal mass ejection coming towards the Earth. And those satellites, since they passed through this magnetic charged plasma, uh, those got fried and basically burnt. So if we know better, about the space weather, we can actually say because it takes a lot of money, human effort to send satellites to, to space. And if, if it is to waste, then it is like a big punch on our face that we don't know the nature well. We need to learn about these things. Another thing is I talked about, so if this is charged magnetic, uh, magnetic gas comes in our electric grids, then it gets, uh, yeah, it will blast, it will get overcharged. And that has happened two times, once in 1992 in a Scandinavian country called Sweden and once in 1978 in Canada. So usually this happens in polar regions because we saw that the magnetic field kind of takes the plasma in the polar regions like this. So there would be some solar event. This is a cartoon image. This is not how science works, but this is a simplified cartoon. So this uh, kind of chunk of plasma, which is charged and magnetized, it will come to the earth. But then since earth magnetic field is directing it to the uh, poles, we see aurora. So this beautiful phenomena is also caused by our sun. And that's me looking at aurora. Uh, and the thing is uh, to actually understand this phenomena better as well, we need to understand the uh, our host star better because it is the source of life. So we have now covered almost all the aspects of it and now we can define habitability. So yeah, so the thing is our earth is just right 
in in its place from the sun it is not too hot where all the atmosphere gets evaporated and it is not too cold where the water cannot remain liquid on the surface or there is no surface because it's too cold so the earth is just right right now but in in some time which is around uh, how much is it 8 billion years from now the uh, the sun will be so big it will be a red giant it is kind of another star so sun is a uh, main sequence star right now which is one way to say that it is not very dramatic it is very mediocre kind of star so it it doesn't do these flares or eruptions very often so that is very good that it is not very dramatic uh, so we we are we are in the habitable zone as of now when the sun is 4.6 billion years old billion is like very big 4.6 billion years is like huge amount of time and in 8 billion years which is even bigger amount of time it will become a red giant so it will become so huge that it will engulf mercury and venus and then earth will be in the place like very close like right up to the sun and it will be too hot to live here uh, then at that time jupiter and saturn might be in the habitable zone so one of the reasons of looking at the satellites of jupiter and saturn for habitability is that we might have to migrate uh, it is a science fiction or you know uh, very fictitious thought right now to migrate to another planet to live but uh, human beings have like 150 years ago migrating to another country to live another continent to live was also fiction so we didn't have uh, aeroplanes at that time so eventually we will build to uh, living into another planets but for that we need to learn about these things first so now are we able to answer these questions can somebody answer like what is habitability i want somebody else to answer <laughs> okay you can say uh, habitability mm -hmm. is the support of life means mm -hmm. if there is habitability life can be supported there yes there. yes and then what are the requirements for life so we listed while while talking we had like five seven things that are required for a planet to have or planet to be yes Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Anything else? Did she miss something? She said that planet should have a solid surface. Planet should have liquid water, right? And it should have atmosphere. Uh, it should have good magnetic field, and it should have a host star. Maybe not too dramatic. What else? Yes. Oh, the goldilocks zone of the star. My God, I didn't say that. Okay, it should be in the goldilocks zone, which is the habitable zone. It's another way of saying that. So, why does Earth around Sun have life? Or we can ask, how do we find other habitable planets? So we right now are looking at the planets which are similar to, which have similar relationship as Sun and Earth have. We are looking at another other planets which have good relationship with their host stars. So. we'll just this is a mid talk summary so what is habitability it is the adequacy of that environment for life around it or for liquid water around it and the requirements are a solid surface liquid water on the surface then the environment should be oxygen rich uh, it should be non burning non acidic atmosphere then planet should have optimal magnetic field complementary to the host star it should get energy from the host star uh, and host star or if there are multiple stars around like it's a binary or multiple stellar system around which these stars are revolving then those should not be too dramatic and that's why we are looking at star planet systems where all the above all the above criteria are satisfied now to do, to look at other other systems we should first understand our system we should first understand our host star so that's why we should understand the activity of our star so that our star is how it is for for as long as we know as long as we have been doing science for our star 
but it might change or we should understand why is it the way it is right now. So um, first we should understand how our star is. So our star has a core and in the core the, uh, the nuclear reactions happen and those reactions uh, create energy and that energy is radiated away. So like immediately in front of the core there is a radiation zone. So the energy is radiated away at, per at per particular uh, radius from the center and then there is a convection zone. So the convection zone, uh, you know the three ways of transport of energy. Have you learnt about it? I should ask in some, yeah? Yes, so here the radiation part happens just right in front of the core. Then the convection part happens after that. But conduction part usually doesn't happen in gases. If you have learned, conduction happens in very solids usually, yes. So only radiation and convection can happen on the stars. And our star has this kind of uh, structure. We can think of it like an onion. In the center, there is a core. Then there is radiation. Then there is convection. And the thing is, it these even if it is gaseous, even if it is this charged magnetic plasma, it is very dense. So what happens is, uh, if the energy or like the energy is photon, it, in a photon is the particle of energy, right? So the photon goes out and it finds a lot of particles around. So then it, it's like being, have you been to some very, very crowded place? So you want to find a path, but you cannot. So you need to, you know, navigate to go out. So that's what happens with the photon. So the photon which is formed in the core as uh, the energy which is formed in the core, that photon if it wants to reach us, it takes 150 billion years. So we haven't seen the photons that are formed. It's, it's like very, very dense. So it, it doesn't uh, allow the photons to pass. So what happens is uh, as we go out of the core, the plasma becomes rare and rare and rare. And there comes a surface which we call photosphere which means the sphere, the layer of the sun, from which the photon can reach us. So uh, we cannot see anything inside the photosphere, we can only see the photosphere and outer layers. So out of the photosphere, then we have something called uh, chromosphere. Um, it's called chromosphere because uh, the first time it was observed in 1900s, uh, they took a filter to look at it and that filter was red. So then it was like very colorful, very bright, and they called it the sphere of color. So that's why it's called chromosphere. And then out of the chromosphere, the, the layer is called corona. And the corona is very haphazard, it's very rare plasma. So it, uh, that's why the COVID virus was called corona because, because it is also, it was also very haphazard. So it is spherical and has a lot of limbs, a lot of uh, appendages coming out of it. So um, we'll, we'll learn about this different temperatures, but I just want to let you know the sphere, like the photosphere has temperature of around 5,700 Kelvin. Then since we are coming away from the hot object, the temperature decreases naturally as it should. So it decreases to around 4,000 Kelvin um, at, at particular layer. And from there, the temperature starts to increase. So the chromosphere is around 4,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. Remember, we are coming away from this hot object. The temperature was nearly 6,000. It went down to 4,000. Then now it increased again. And by the time we reach corona, it is around a million Kelvin. So this is a puzzle that most of the solar physicists are trying to solve. Um, so yeah. One more thing about the sun is that it rotates differentially. So what happens is the equator rotates faster. It rotates in 25 days because it's a gas. It's not like earth which rotates around itself within one day, right? So the equator rotates in 25 days. But as we, as we like in this sphere, as we go towards the pole, the, the time of rotation increases. And the pole rotates in 35 days. So what happens is this is a charged magnetic like ball of gas and it is rotating differentially. So the magnetic field of the sun is very peculiar because of that. And this happens with all the stars. The magnetic fields of stars is something of a 
problem that we like to solve. Um, so just to visually imagine it, the earth magnetic field is dipolar, right? So there is north pole, there is south pole and the, the magnetic lines, field lines are very uh, neat, like it's like a bar magnet. But with the solar differential rotation and having magnetized charged gas, the magnetic field of the sun is very complicated. So this is one of the observations. Uh, the magnetic field lines are imaginary. So those are calculated based on some models. Uh, it's just for our visual understanding of the magnetic field. So this is another example for that. And the, the thing is, um, the, the magnetic field is sustained by something called dynamo inside the uh, core of the sun. So dynamo is the thing that converts electricity into magnetism and magnetism into electricity, right? You must be learning it soon or maybe some, some of you might know about it. So that dynamo uh, needs some fuel, like, right? So why would it convert energy? Because it will need some triggers for it. And those triggers uh, eventually should die off as per our understanding of physics. But we do not understand why for several billion years, for, for almost all the stars, these, these dynamos have been behaving the same way. They are not changing. So we are trying to understand that. And that is one of the major problems in solar physics as well. This is just to illustrate how the big and how strong the magnetic fields are. This is the, the Earth for scale. And these are the coronal loops that we talked about. So these are so huge. And the magnetic field and the plasma is sustained so well. Uh, it, it's just to understand how, how we should look at it. Now, um, do you guys know what this is? Sunspot. sunspot, yes. So there are these features on the sun, like sunspots, or these bright CP features, which are called plage regions. Plage in French means sea. So uh, they looked like waves on the beach to the first observer and they called it plage. This is just a fun fact. So um, these are like big, huge waves and motions of plasma on the surface of sun, which are bright. So this surface is chromosphere. We can see it in red usually. Uh, red in the sense the wavelength that we observe is, is in the visual red spectrum. And then this is corona. You can see like all the plasma is coming out in all the directions. So these different uh, layers of the sun do not look the same in the whole period of like always, right? So they, they look different, slightly different in different phases of time. So uh, again, I put this picture because I like Corona. I'm working on Corona. And we can see these loops are here. And then there are these uh, dark features and then there are smaller loops, then there are regions where there are no features. And these differences in the uh, surface of the sun, the activity level as scientists call it, we call this activity. So this is, this is what we call the sun is active when it is showing a lot of features. And there are times when sun is not as active. So these uh, features which are active, we try to look at those and try to understand how the plasma behaves. And for example, here we can see like there are these currents or motions of plasma happening and a lot of big loops are being created because of that. And those loops are sustained because the particles are charged and magnetized so they can move along the magnetic field lines. So this is something called the solar activity. So the sun has these, these features come and go. So you might have seen uh, that when you go, to, go uh, in Ayuka, there are these uh, small uh, telescopes from which we can see the photosphere and we can see these sunspots. So those sunspots don't be there all the time. Firstly, the sun rotates. So the spots rotate on the surface of the sun. And secondly, the spots come and go. So they are not like, you know, uh, sticking there all the time. Those are not like, you know, Himalayas and they just rotate around it. So those are, these are gases, so they move. So these uh, sunspots, there are times when there are least amount of sunspots or least amount of these plage regions or least amount of these uh, coronal loops or coronal mass ejections. And then there are times when a lot of these occur simultaneously at the uh, fast pace. 
So the times when we have least of it, we call it the lower activity or quiet activity. And at the times when we have a lot of those features, we call it the active phase. So these have approximately 11 years uh, cycle. So right now we are in active part. So uh, you have, you must have uh, read in the newspaper that in the May month of May, uh, I think 27th or so May, there was a huge uh, coronal mass ejection, a huge flare. And a lot of people were seeing auroras, a lot of people were uh, talking about keeping the lights closed in, in the polar regions usually. This doesn't affect equator regions because the magnetic field takes the plasma at the poles as we saw. So um, if we extrapolate this because we are in the middle of the cycle, so I could not make this kind of image for uh, current times, but from 2020, if we extrapolate it, we are currently at something like this phase in 2024, in 2025 as well, it will be very active. Um, so this is a very nice time to see Aurora, if we can afford it. But uh, this just, uh, it, it's very close to my heart. So this is just to uh, summarize the coronal heating problem. So we can see that the core of the sun is very hot, then the temperature decreases, then it goes to 4000 Kelvin, some, the, somewhere here there is photosphere and then the temperature increases and it goes again to millions of Kelvin. So this is, this is not something a hot body does. If we go away from hot body, it should cool. That's what, that, that's what Newtonian physics says, but that's not happening. So we are trying to understand this. Um, the last thing is how do we observe sun? So there are several observatories uh, all across the world and if you can Maybe name a couple of them. Can you? Yes. Uh, the one on top is the Trambe Mumbai of Baba Atomic Research Center. Um, no, <laughs> no, it's not. But uh, I, I don't think there is any solar observatory there. But this one is in India, if you can name it. And also this one is in India. And one that we saw before, uh, the Aditya L1 suit, that is also in an Indian mission. But apart from these three, all the others are not in India, those are outside. So maybe somebody else you want to say something? Are the others in Australia? No, those are all over the world, uh, in other places. So um, this one is in Udaipur. Uh, it is near the lake to actually reduce the noise because the water will absorb heat and the instrument will be more stable because there is less heat. Uh, this one is in Kodai Canal. Uh, it's on top of a hill because then the atmospheric layer on top of it is like comparatively lesser. So the noise is reduced again. This is Solar Dynamic Observatory. Most of the uh, movies and images that we saw in the talk are from this observatory. Then there is uh, something called European Solar Telescope. Um, this is Parker Solar Probe, which is also an, a satellite, which is even closer to the sun, yes? So can we conclude that we can uh, observe the sun from the North Pole or the countries that are uh, closer to the sun and um, it's, a, it's a good conclusion, but the problem with observing the sun from the poles is that earth has a tilt, right? So uh, if you have observed it here as well, we are not at the equator, but we are at a bit northwards. So the days and nights are smaller here when we are in winter, right? The sun sets at 5 or so, but in summer the sun sets at 7, 7.30 or so. That becomes extreme as we go at the poles. So at the poles, uh, there is something called polar night in the winters. So we cannot see the sun for the whole winter. And then there is polar day, which is in the summer usually for several months, the sun even doesn't set. So this is economically not very feasible because when we are at the poles, we, I mean, when we set up an observatory, we would like to see the sun regularly, right? Uh, but then if we cannot see the sun almost half of the year, it's not very feasible. So most of the polar countries, if they want to invest in, uh, like their governments, if they want to invest in observations of the sun, uh, then they uh, put their observatories in uh, equator regions. For example, this European Solar Telescope is uh, sponsored by a lot of European countries. And some of the European countries are near the pole. 
but they also have sponsored for this they get their personal time to observe the sun like you can go there and set up the observatory to you know look at small patches of the sun and so on uh, but this observatory is uh, located near equator so there is an island called la palma and this observatory is on that island it's not on the pole um oh sorry this this is la palma solar telescope the est is also in la palma but there is like dedicated solar telescope which is in la palma so you know what this is yes so this is something very exciting um this telescope doesn't look at sun okay this telescope looks far away from from earth but it has such a great precision we can look at other stars and we can look at other planets around the stars to explore our uh, initial goal of looking for habitable planets right so so this is something uh, almost all the astrophysicists are very excited about and then i would like to leave you guys with the conclusions firstly what are the current problems in solar physics one is this coronal heating problem where we don't know how outer layer is hotter than the inner layer then there is variability in the solar or stellar activity because the we are, we, we are not sure why this 11 year is the period or sometimes why is it shorter sometimes why is it longer and so on then uh, we would like to be able to predict the space weather because then based on that we can send the uh, satellites uh, in lesser active times and not get them fried um then we want to study how the the magnetic field inside the stars or sometimes inside the planets is generated and that would kind of give us an insight into uh, in energy production on earth as well because if we get uh, more uh, yeah optimized way of producing energy then then that is very beneficial for humans and one is the imaging problem so this is i didn't talk about i'll just touch it in a minute uh so we have two kinds of observatories one is ground based which is an observatory on the earth right for for that what happens is the sun sets so like wherever we stay the sun will set at some point we cannot see it all the time uh also we'll have a lot of noise because we have atmosphere on top of the the observatory so we will have to invest a lot in to reducing the noise we'll have to invest a lot into getting uh more scientific data than you know some instrument is moving or some car went by and there is vibrations and so on right so that noise reduction is a is a huge problem on the other hand in the space there would not be these atmospheric aberrations or noise but sending the data from far away and receiving it on the earth uh, in between that there can be uh, noise in introduced and also because it is far away uh we cannot send a lot of data at the same time whereas since it is on the earth we can just you know go out with a pen drive and get the data but with sending data from far away there is limitation on how much you can observe so th that is an imaging issue which is a kind of a conundrum we we like to have a better solution for it on the front of uh, exoplanets or astrobiology uh we have these challenges that the instruments have limits right so if there are planets far away if there are stars far away there they have very less uh, signal coming from there that even jwst like huge you know very technologically advanced satellite uh, observatory can observe it so there is a problem of detectability the instrument has some limitations and we we do not know the stars well so right now uh, that's the aim to understand our host stars very well and simultaneously building up on the statistics of other stars and there is something called fermi paradox uh you might know it or you can google it it's very uh, intriguing as uh, as a kid i was very uh, intrigued by this one so it just says why has nobody contacted us yet because the universe is so large uh we are not very unique the sun is a very mediocre star so far away from us there might be some place where there might be some alien life and why haven't they contacted us do they find us very you know mediocre are we not good enough for them or do they find us very intimidating like they are very primitive and they find that if we contact them then they might like we might go to them and kill them 
So this kind of science fiction paradox is a Fermi paradox and it's it's just good to think about it. I don't think there is a solution for it unless we actually get alien signals. Um, and a philosophical question of do we want to communicate with aliens? Do we want to have neighbors for us? Um, it's just to think about uh, and that's it. The important thing is to not ask, never stop questioning. Yes. Uh, now you can ask questions. Stop questioning. Come on, where are the questions? questions? Where are the questions? Uh, if you want to take some time to think about the topics, you can do that. But whoever has a question can raise your hand. We have uh, our other colleagues who will come to you with a mic. We have a question in front to start with. Just wait for the question to, I mean, the mic to come to you. <laughs> Others can wait for the question to come to you. Yes. I wanted to give an answer okay. to the coronal mass heating problem. Okay. <laughs> it is because of the magnetic field of the sun. The sun's magnetic field is due to its gravity, temperature and density, it bends and there are loops. When these loops untangle, they release a huge shock wave, which leads to the excitement of the plasma, which leads to the increase of temperature of corona. Yes. So this leads to coronal mass heating, but due to its intensity, there is a little gap of 1 lakh degree Celsius, but I think that will be filled up by the layers below it. <laughs> okay, good attempt. I'm, I'm sure like, yeah, the, yeah. all the other solar physicists will be also interested in finding out the real answer. With, with more advanced studies of the sun with Aditya L1, which was mentioned. So that was the other space achievement we had this year, space astronomy achievement. We had several other space achievements. Yes, please we'll start with the questions. So is now any planet uh, we have seen that has life now? No, not yet. There have been planets where we find water, where we find oxygen, nitrogen and so on, but uh, no life yet. Uh, so you asked a question that uh, in the uh, problems for exoplanet, you asked that uh, why has no one contacted us yet? So uh, in that, how, if, uh, if someone is trying to contact us, how would we get to know if someone is actually trying to contact us or not? Yeah, so uh, in 1970s, there was this uh, something called Harvard study. So they had a huge radio antenna because for long distance, you cannot contact with, uh, you know, optical wavelengths because they have a lot of noise in it if, if it travels for long distance. So usually you would like to have a wavelength which is longer so that it, it has lesser noise in it. So they that is called radio wavelengths. And uh, they, they, the radio wavelengths need to have huge antennas to, you know, detect it if they are longer and longer and longer. So in Harvard, they had set up a huge radio antenna to detect long distance radio wavelengths. Uh, they detected one signal one time and that was it. But uh, that signal eventually was uh, like marked as something from some other kind of stars called pulsars. And then another field of astrophysics opened up with that pulsar study, but uh, no alien signals yet. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah? There is a radio signal from the Kutam constellation, which brings that from past 25 years. Data in Shisro from past 25 years. I think uh, you, we, you need to ask permission to speak first. The thing is that, please, uh, these are un verified news that you are giving so this information if you can uh, wait and talk to us separately about it right so don't put anything into nasa's or isro's pocket just because it's out on google or internet right so let's go to the questions please yes in future can we uh, land on sun no <laughs> we just uh, like talked about that sun doesn't have a surface so we cannot land on it to start with and it is extremely hot so we cannot go anywhere near it either uh, good morning, ma'am. 
Uh, I have a question. Uh, can life exist on Titan? Can you repeat it? Uh, can life exist on Titan, Saturn's moon? Uh, I don't know of yet, but uh, th there is no detection of water on Titan yet. Mm -hmm. So our first uh, criteria is to have liquid water. And if that is not met, then probably not. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, in space, water is in ice form or in vapor? Uh, usually, there is no water in space, but if it is there, then it would be in ice form, I believe. I'm not sure because the temperature of the space is 3 Kelvin, which is minus 270 degrees Celsius. So, it can only be in ice form, I think. Yeah. What if someone actually contacts us? What are we going to do after that? Yeah, so there is a protocol at NASA, what, what, like it's a 20 or something steps protocol at NASA of what we should do if we detect an alien signal. I'm not very aware of it, I just know that it exists. Hello. Good morning, ma'am. Hi. Uh, all we need is just a kind of line form. So can't we just take cell from other planets and take them, uh, bring them to Earth and grow them here? Like Repeat the first part of the question. All we need is another kind of life form. So for growing another kind of life form, can't we just take other cells or... Uh, I don't think we need another form of life form. We just want to know if they exist. And we don't want to take them here and grow because we don't know of them, right? So we don't know how their biology works, if they exist and so on. So uh, the question is not about having like other life forms. The question is if they exist or not, right? Yeah. Remember, they can be, uh, you know, they can be very similar us. to us, but they can be very different from us as well. So we are looking at life forms very similar to us because we know of a data point of a life on the Earth near Sun where the life is flourishing, where it exists, but we do not know of any other data of other any other kind of life. So. For example, we are carbon-based life, right? So carbon has this, uh, it, it is very versatile. It can form bonds with a lot of uh, atoms. So carbon-based life is possible is what we know. But silicon, for example, is also in the same uh, column in the as carbon in the periodic table, if you know, right? So silicon is also equally versatile. It can also form uh, bonds with a lot of different atoms, slightly less than carbon because it has higher mass. But there have been like this field of astrobiology where people talk about sure. extraterrestrial life. They have been uh, talking about finding life which is based on silicon. They have been trying to make bonds with, of silicon with other things. So it's just an experiment. Uh, and we are just looking at all the possibilities that there can be. Okay. Remember for, for sake of science, can't we just grow them here and see whether they are helpful or not what if they are not <laughs> we don't know <laughs> okay ma it's, it's very you. difficult to create a life form so that's first thing uh, since this talk has some forays into aliens and things like that i know your imaginations are now fired up but please uh, i'll just yeah. explain to you that we are talking about study of habitability Okay, so it can also mean that whether there's a planet where we can go and survive or something like that, right? So it's not just about finding aliens, it might be also about finding our own alternative, which we should not find, we should preserve the Earth as it is, <laughs> as, as much as possible. So if you have some questions more about habitability and the study of habitability, that, that would be more welcome. Uh, who's going then? You can go. Uh, good morning, ma'am and sir. My question is, have we humans ever made any attempts to contact aliens ourselves? Yes, they, uh, there is this uh, one signal with uh, basic mathematics, basic biology, basic chemistry, uh, basic anatomy of humans uh, that is sent out, some, some arts and sociology and so on as well. Uh, it, it is sent in, in the same kind of wavelengths, which is radio wavelengths. Uh, it has been uh, continuously sent out and we haven't been contacted by anybody yet. Hello. 
Ma'am, my question was actually if we are uh, trying to receive signals from the extraterrestrial life means which exists in space or outer space. Uh, so isn't it risky for us to contact because we also don't know in uh, means do they have a language to communicate between themselves and can we also learn that language? Yes, that is the philosophical question of do we want to communicate with aliens? Yeah, we don't know yet. There is no definite answer to that. Okay. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if the sun bursts, it would turn into a white dwarf sphere, right? So why don't we try to uh, search any planet outside our, our own galaxy? And because of sun bursts, is there any use of searching life on our in our own galaxy? So sun is one of uh, millions of stars in our galaxy. So if sun bursts, actually the other stars are not going to be as much affected by it. So and also looking at stars in other galaxies is uh, very much more complicated because the galaxies are far away. So the signal that we get from those stars uh, is very less. So we cannot say much very definitely about those. Uh, but the other stars in our own galaxy are comparatively nearby. So we can study those better. Hello ma'am, why would the sun turn into a red giant? Um, because the thing is, the, the sun as of it is now, it has uh, hydrogen and helium in the core and they interact, react with each other in nuclear reactions to form energy. And in that process, uh, this is kind of a domino effect. So there is a cascade of reactions that happen. So first, this uh, helium and hydrogen uh, react together and as we that energy is propagated outwards, uh, there are other very small atoms in, in the uh, outside plasma of the sun. So this nuclear reactions form bigger and bigger atoms, right, uh, in, in those reactions. And in that process, these helium and hydrogen are depleted. So eventually there is very less hydrogen and helium left in the core of the sun and that's why it cannot sustain the mass. So then eventually it grows out and out and out. That's why it becomes a red giant. So that is how the life of a star is. Uh, it is bound to happen. We cannot stop it. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask that we neglect exoplanets just because they don't have a star. So what if, uh, like, can they have some other source of energy? that we have uh, we are unaware about they might but uh, in in our this is kind of uh, this is called kind of a blind study so we do not know what we are looking at so since we already know that there is life on earth which is bound to sun then we would like to uh, have this as our reference so if we if we know of another planet which is rogue planet which has life on it then that can be a reference that whatever the source of energy that planet has could be uh, like similar situation could be present in other planets and so on. But right now that's not our aim. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is what kind of technologies will we use if we found life on any other planet? Like how will we go there? Probably we'll build that when we find it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, my question is that have we ever tried and uh, sent any satellites so that aliens can discover it and uh, contact us? Uh, not with that motivation, but uh, if you know of Apollo missions, that satellite has already crossed the influence of sun. So it is going away from the sol solar system and that might be detected at some point of time by some aliens, but that will be very far away in time. So it will, uh, we will not be there. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, I want to ask the question that uh, can sun uh, burst into a supernova? No, sun is very small for that. Uh, the sun's mass is very less. If another star which has more mass uh, with the same process of, you know, becoming red giant and so on, it may uh, blast into a supernova. I cannot see you actually. Uh, 
okay so my question is that europa you said that europa has a high chance of habitability so as europa is a satellite it does not have light of its own and jupiter is a planet so it just reflects the light of the sun and uh, if, even if it comes into the zone of habitability will it get enough energy because jupiter is always going to be in the way uh it's a very good question but why that i mean this is just a science fiction speculation this is not a scientific answer that i'm giving but by the time uh, in around 80 billion 8 billion years from now when uh, we might have to move to europa uh, we we will be technologically very advanced so we can have mirrors or something i don't know this is just a speculative science fiction answer sir one or two more questions uh, good morning ma'am uh, ma'am my question to you is uh, since in more 8 billion years the sun will become a supernova will it burst the earth will the earth be affected in yes. another 8 million years yes yes the sun uh, will not become a supernova that's what she has just answered sun will become a red giant, a red giant. Yes. and is it will become huge is there any chance of so affecting the it earth will affect will be affected yes Uh, ma'am uh, my question is to you is uh, that what are the future plans of istro and nasa <laughs> means i don't know what are they going to like <laughs> they are they are doing a lot of work so which particular uh, thing that you do you want them to do you tell us uh, like what will be the future plans for them to explore the sun and it's answering trying things. to find answers to these questions that are listed at the end and ma'am my second question to you is what is your exact qualification Very good. So uh, I did bachelor's and master's in physics, and then I did doctorate in uh, solar physics. And right now I'm doing research in solar physics. In, in, do, you, do you want to share some tidbits about your childhood and how you got into astronomy? Maybe uh, as a last thing to end the <laughs> session and inspire all the. Yeah, as a here. as a kid, um, I was interested in science and also history and uh, arts, a lot of things simultaneously. and probably when i was in 9th or 10th uh, it occurred to me that i'm more inclined in science and then i had in 11th uh, there is something called inspire camp uh, and i luckily got selected for that and i got to visit hbcsc and tifr uh, for 5 days training there i got to know about icer and a lot of other research institutes and what research can be and so on uh, then my aim became to go to icer then i went to icer uh there i was more inclined to do mathematics in the beginning and uh, eventually i realized i'm probably more cut out for physics uh so i did a masters in physics and then uh, this kind of, i mean i eventually by the time i was in answer i sir i realized i want to go to astronomy and yeah this just happened Lovely. so <laughs> it's very nice so uh, you can see how career decisions change you can right now you may be interested in something you think oh, that's the only thing i want to do in life two years three years later maybe you'll be doing something else but keep your goals keep your short term goals long term goals and we have inspiring people like dr sneha here uh, who have shared their life story and their research with you so if any of these tips are good for you uh, you can follow up you can follow up with us also you can visit ayuka at other times and we are all here you can interact with you for a longer time Uh, in for more informal ways uh also uh just just remember that uh you're at school level right now and we are getting you exposed to some information which may not which either may be going over your head or is something which is to happen in the future right so many of you are asking what are the plans what are you doing things like that uh probably me her all will be retired when you are coming to the peak of your research time right so please remember that in 10 years from now you might be researchers and you might be here answering these questions what are you doing so you should have that answer <laughs> and if you have a plan if you have an idea come up with it study science right it's just i mean there are some some stereotypical fields which are prescribed to you all the time but there is a lot of uh, scope to contribute to our knowledge the knowledge of humanity through science so science is a nice uh, way to uh, continue uh, uh, into a career okay so hopefully this uh, this session has given you some inspiration uh, particularly coming from dr sneha let us thank her once more